Hello, and thanks for joining us for the second of our webinar series celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, or known mostly as NCHEMS. These seminars are hosted by uh, NCHEM staff members who have very specific expertise in higher education issues and practices. And today, we're featuring NCHEM's Vice President, Brian Prescott, as he and his guests look at issues and practices in higher education state systems. Liz, could we go to the next slide? Great. I am Sally Johnstone, president of NCHEMS, but before I turn this over to Brian, let me take a minute to explain our format. We will be listening to the panelists discuss a set of issues for the first part of this webinar. Then we will ask them to respond to your questions. I am also joined today, if we go to the next slide, Liz, thank you. Uh, by two of my colleagues here at NCHEM, Sarah Torres Lugo, who will monitor the questions you want to ask the panelists, and Liz Weeks, who will be running the webinar for us. Now to pose a question or comment, and could we go to the next slide, you click on the Q&A in your controls. If you're in full screen mode, you might need to hover your mouse over your screen to make the controls visible. Once you click on Q&A, a window will appear. Then you type your question in the text field and click to send it. If you want to pose, pose a question to a specific panelist, please make sure to begin your question with the name of that individual. The chat mode will not be monitored, so please use only the Q&A feature. Let me go ahead and turn this over now to Brian to get us going. Good afternoon and thanks, Sally. I'm excited to lead this webinar today on a topic of growing importance uh, in, a, in a, a shifting climate in higher education, the role of systems and systems approaches to addressing uh, the challenges uh, posed by demography and by financial conditions and, uh, and in order to better serve student success. Over the next hour, we're going to try to accomplish a few things. We want to focus on uh, multi-institutional collaboration uh, to address these challenges and to better serve students. Uh, we'll talk about cross-institutional approaches that balance statewide needs with more narrow and not always perfectly congruent institutional perspectives. We'll discuss the ways in which different policy actors perceive their roles in uh, helping to play a role, play a part within a, uh, a higher education institution working within a systems architecture. And then we'll talk about differences and how that all plays out based on uh, governance structure, structural differences, specifically around governing versus coordinating boards. To do this, I'm joined by two pioneering thinkers and leaders in higher education today. First, we're joined by Aaron Thompson, who as president of the Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education, leads his state coordinating board and provides policy leadership for the state's public four-year institutions and the Kentucky Council on Community and Technical Colleges. Aaron has held that position uh, since last October, um, but over the years he has served CPE, over eight years, uh, most recently as the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. And for a little more than a year, beginning in 2016, uh, Aaron stepped away from CPE to serve as the interim president of Kentucky State University, a public H HBCU in that state. Our second guest is Jason Lane, who is a widely respected scholar, respected scholar of higher education, currently serving as the interim dean of the College of Education and associate professor at the State University of New York at Albany. But in addition to being a, a scholar, Jason is a practitioner and policy leader. Prior to returning to the faculty, Jason served in the SUNY Central Administration, where he was integrally involved in implementing the SUNY Strategic Plan, which under Nancy's leadership as chancellor uh, is itself one of the more significant expressions of systems thinking in higher education today. Uh, in addition, Jason serves on the steering committee of the Taking Student Success to Scale Project, which is better known as TS3, an initiative of the National Association of System Heads 
which seeks to unlock collective impact and high impact practices uh, for students attending um, institution, public institutions that are part of systems. I've asked Jason and Aaron to address some questions germane to this topic uh, that we'll um, work on in a moment, uh, and then we'll have room for audience questions. But before I get into that, um, I'd like to offer some framing for the conversation. And in doing so, I would be remiss not to acknowledge the contributions of Incham's own Ames McGinnis to, the, uh, to this conversation, to this uh, uh, line of thinking over the years. Liz, can you move the slide forward, please? So higher education systems grew up in an era of plenty, uh, originally uh, built to um, manage growth in the, in the era leading up to and past uh, post-World War II, in which higher education was growing both in terms of enrollments, but also new institutions were forming and whole new institutional sectors uh, were coming on, online. Um, leadership provided by systems and uh, state agencies around this topic was intended to create more rational policy making, um, primarily in, in the area of, for example, uh, eliminating duplication of programs, but also these organizations were created to provide a buffer um, between the policy makers and, and institutions and to reduce tendency, the tendency for regional and institutional interests combined to eat away at what might have made most sense for states. Of course, they were also uh, created to ensure compliance with regulations designed to uh, protect the, the interests of the public purse and also to reduce inappropriate influence. And by the 1980s, the era of consolidation that gave rise to so many systems and, and state agencies gave way a little bit to a more distributed authority as not just in higher education, but in state government more generally, there was a push to, to provide more flexibility for management of agencies and institutions. And by the 1990s, the, that orientation became more, um, even more intentionally oriented toward the marketplace. And it, the interests of efficiency and scale, especially around student mobility and the sharing of administrative services came to the fore. So during this period of time in general, systems and systems approaches evolved as a concept from a centralized authority primarily out to manage growth, uh, but also to advance regulation and, and, uh, and compliance with regulation and to reduce regional influence um, in favor of statewide uh, perspective to um, bodies that were intended to lead and implement a statewide agenda to assist the issues of what we often refer to quote, in, in quotes as the within and between issues that, that often fall between the cracks of institutions and increasingly to steer state assets towards society's broad challenges. In today's climate, uh, as we come into it, we're facing stagnant or declining enrollment demand, and that's especially true of traditional age students, uh, all of whom are expected to sh increasingly shoulder larger share of the costs of higher education. And these uh, conditions have led more institutions to operate closer to the financial edge. Uh, and those that are doing that are often those most likely to serve the low income first generation underrepresented and rural student populations that uh, are the ones most at risk and the ones that we need to be most successful with to, to achieve our, our state and national goals. So, Driven by fiscal realities and in changes in how students experience higher education, including innovation, uh, there's increasingly a need to emphasize collaboration and systems approaches have the potential to do so effectively. And I want to offer, if you'll go ahead to the next slide, please, um, three buckets to think about. Whoops, I, I should have asked you to put this slide up somewhat earlier. I apologize. If you could go to the next um, slide, Liz. Thank you. I would offer um, three buckets to think about for collaborative activities, each of which has different challenges and opportunities. First, we've already mentioned is the back office and administrative tasks that have been the focus of a lot of, uh, of sharing efforts over the years. This is in areas, things like procurement and legal services. But increasingly, we're seeing the need to have more uh, focus on trying to create collaborations around academic programs and delivery and around student services. 
these two areas, of course, are, are perhaps more fraught with tension uh, than the uh, administrative one. Uh, they um, implicate you know, what might be typical questions about institutional autonomy and academic freedom, but also it's unclear uh, at the start how to fund collaborative activities effectively. And of course, these things must account for different missions and different student body characteristics. And particularly with the, with the last one, uh, it's important to be uh, very thoughtful about when it's necessary to provide on-site or face-to-face -face support when necessary. And so with that as rough framing, uh, next slide please, Liz. Um, I wanna go ahead and, and, and pose some questions to our panelists and begin the discussion. So I think probably first and foremost, even though I've offered a, an introduction, a little bit of an introduction, if, uh, if, if Drs. Thompson and Lane can offer a little bit of information about your state and the role you play in trying to lead the higher edu education enterprise toward a set of state goals. Yes, Brian, thank you. Good afternoon, Sally, Jason. It's good to be with you and the audience members. Uh, we're happy to be a part of this conversation and obviously I believe a necessary conversation in today's time. <clears throat> Kentucky is a state that some people would describe as poor, uh, but I like to describe it as a state of opportunity. Uh, we are a high poverty state, no doubt, and we have the kind of uh, inputs, I guess, in place that we're trying to address those, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We've also been a state that's been cut uh, fairly severely, some would argue, over the last 10 years. The 10 years previous to that, we, from our baseline, we were one of the more uh, progressive states in areas of growing credentials and, and, and both our community colleges and our four-year institutions, and really led those areas as was described by NCHIMS back in, I think, 2010-11. One of the things that I will tell you is that since uh, post-secondary reform in the state in 1997, uh, and let me put this even in a little more context since we're gonna talk about uh, coordinating boards versus systems board. We are a coordinating board, but we are a coordinating board with some systems powers. Uh, so today I'll talk a lot about systemness more than systems, if you will, uh, but in, 1997, post-secondary reform, with the help of people like Ames McGinnis, you mentioned him earlier, Kentucky moved from an old uh, Council on Higher Education, which had very little power, to a coordinating board that had a lot more power. Uh, and we also, at that time, took away the community colleges from our flagship institution. Uh, and then we took the technical colleges who were kind of out there by themselves, and we combined those two and went through accreditation and created a Kentucky uh, 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 community tech and technical college system. And CPE was given the powers in this post-secondary reform to do a variety of things. One, obviously, comprehensive program approval and review, and I mean comprehensive, uh, set the statewide agenda public agenda uh, for higher ed, in which uh, our public agenda, all of our higher ed public institutions have to buy into it. We also had the power to post budgets uh, through the legislature for each of our campuses, as well as set tuition ceilings and so on. So we, we, we have a lot more than that uh, in, our, in our bucket uh, that we need to uh, take advantage of or talk about later on as we talk about systems. But more specifically, you know, I like to look at ourselves as influencers, if you will. And when we get to that point, hopefully we'll talk about it. I personally am someone that was raised in Kentucky public education, going through earlier times of, of uh, integration, and then moving through the system and going to a Kentucky university for my uh, baccalaureate degrees and later on my master's and my doctorate even though I stepped out of the state for a while at, uh, at a research institution in another state, I came back as an administrator, moved up through the faculty and administrative ranks and academics, and then become the chief academic officer, and then later on the chief uh, operating officer before now being the chief executive officer. And as Brian said, taking a little time to be president of an institution. But 
what what you'll find here in Kentucky is a, a desire to go back to those progressive pioneering ways that we are known for, uh, for higher ed. And hopefully, uh, Brian, we'll get to talk about that a little more in a minute. So I'm, this is Jason Lane. I'm also thrilled to be able to be on this conversation with uh, Aaron, Brian, and Sally. And to contrast a little bit, uh, where, where Kentucky is a, a coordinating board in the way that Aaron describes, SUNY uh, is fully a, a governing board. And so in New York, we have two public systems of higher education, SUNY and CUNY, CUNY covering the city, uh, University of New York, and SUNY covering uh, the rest of the state. But SUNY is a 64 campus system of higher education, We're representing everything from small rural community colleges up through large urban research centers, making it an interesting uh, collection of campuses to be able to work with. We serve uh, more than 400,000 students in degree granting programs, and if you think about all the continuing ed and other sorts of non-degree programs, that number was up to about 1.4 million students uh, across all of New York State. And as Brian mentioned, after the, uh, the Great Recession, uh, we began to stop and think about what's a different way to uh, reform uh, higher education to sort of think collectively about the way we work together and uh, came up with a strategic plan that was uh, called the power of, of SUNY, where we really began to think about this concept of systemness uh, along the buckets of academic and student success. We really looked at collaboration in the area of research, uh, our, our important role around community vitality and quality of life, uh, and then also thinking about global engagements and the ways in which we work work around the world and doing that in a collective sense. Uh, having stepped away a bit from leadership roles in the SUNY system, uh, Nancy Zinfer and I, our former chancellor, uh, created what we call the System Center, which is now an academic uh, applied research entity at the University of Albany that's looking at studying this concept of systemness in a more uh, academic way, but also thinking about the ways that we can help other systems uh, begin to work in this area and to think collectively about the concept of systemness and multi-institutional collaboration, uh, which led us to work uh, very closely with the National Association System Heads, uh, where we launched five years ago Taking Student Success to Scale, which is a network of 24 systems of higher ed, looking to implement uh, three evidence-based practices that are focused on student success in the areas of predictive analytics, uh, redesigning math pathways uh, and thinking about high impact practices. But the idea in all of this is how do we harness the collective resources of multiple campuses uh, in a way that can better benefit each and every student uh, that we serve. So um, looking forward to continuing this conversation. I'll turn it back to you, Brian. Thanks very much. I appreciate that, gentlemen. Um, as you are thinking about, I mentioned at the outset, we would talk a little bit about the different uh, perspectives of policy actors. And so I want to just ask directly, how is the role of the system or systemness viewed from the perspectives of boards and executive leadership, campus leaders, and state political leadership in your in your state? Well, I'll, I'll take it to start out. I, I think from the aspect of the Council on Post-Secondary Education, we have a council that oversees uh, all of the institutions in the sense of the word that we approve many of the items that come from the Board of Regents, which each campus has. In other words, we're not a governing board, but once again, we have some governing uh, powers of approval and then a lot of influencing power. So the campuses are used to that now. Uh, we've made it very clear that we're not trying to be your governing system, while at the same time we have a job to do around accountability, a job to do around actually advancing the state, and right now under uh, what we're trying to do here is even create some disruption and looking at ourselves toward 10 years down the road and not just now, especially as we look at educational attainment. So they've gotten used to that conversation, but we've done it in a way uh, that's very collaborative, I would argue. So when you think about the 250,000 or so students that we serve, we're looking at those uh, in aggregate and disaggregation about how do we improve higher education. So as we set our strategic agenda that the campuses have to buy into with our strategic plans, they're used to that. They're used to that collaboration. They're used to that connection. As we look toward setting uh, what I said a minute ago, disruption, you know, that creates some consternation, obviously, because it is doing something different than we've done before, and we walk on the fine line 
of uh, the idea of are we the governance board or do they have their own governance board and who has the right to kind of push some of these uh, agendas forward. And we've come to a conclusion that we both do. So uh, now you have the legislature that obviously put us in place. At times, they want us to be a lot stronger than what they've given us the powers to be. And at times, we can do that, to be honest with you. But once again, it's more informal power than formal power. And, and we've been very successful at that, I think, in Kentucky. But when we look at truly the faculty and the staff on the campuses, uh, they look at us in a way that they see us as hope in some cases, and then as a bureaucratic mess in other cases, because we ask them to turn in a lot of different things around assessment and so on. So we are truly at times between a rock and a hard place. But at those times, for us, communication becomes the key. So all of these players you mentioned, Brian, they have different roles for us. And we interact with them in a way that kind of try to uh, connect all those roles. But in fact, we become uh, that by which they need for us to be as much as we can, while at the same time being what we are, and that's coordinating board moving the statewide agenda forward for what's good for the state and the citizens of the state. So multiplicity of uh, roles we have, multiplicity of decision-making powers we have, but more than anything else, uh, the argument, once again, is about good communication and good transparency. Aaron hit on a lot of great points there, and I'll echo uh, just a couple of those. But you know, the question you asked, Brian, is one that is old as systems themselves. You know, what is going to be the role of the system, which is essentially this boundary spanner between our elected officials and policymakers uh, and the campuses, in many ways. And I think that you know their ability to sort of navigate that has ebbed and flowed over time. Inevitably, right, the, the, there's tension right between all these actors, which the systems are caught between. And I think that tension is often defined by levels of authority and autonomy, uh, you know, who has authority to do what, who has the autonomy and make decisions about what they want to be able uh, to do. And one of the things I learned early on in working with, uh, with InChem staff, Dennis Jones and Ames McGinnis, was really that, that the tension tends to increase the more that systems try to do the same thing that campuses do. Uh, the more that they struggle over who has authority, the more that tensions are heightened. And so I think what we're seeing now is a, an evolution of systems uh, coordinating boards, the way Aaron talked about this, toward uh, more of a, a facilitative approach of leadership, one where uh, these entities are trying to assist in advancing the public agenda, but doing it in a way that's, that's invoking collaboration, uh, that's invoking an ability to, to bring people together to create change in a meaningful way. Whereas I think uh, for a long time, systems acted more like state agencies. I think they're now flowing back toward the sense of, of the academic side of the, the boundary and, and, and trying to advance if initiatives around student success, uh, particularly as the completion agenda has come on more online and thinking about that quality add uh, of what they have for institutions. You know, one of the things we do is we, uh, we work with NASH on running a, an academy every year for teams of systems and campus people to come together to think about how do you facilitate transformational change and what has been great about that is you know every year we do it the more we see people from across campuses coming together and finding meaningful value in working and partnering with each other uh, on advancing initiatives around student success and I think 10 years ago that was not the case there's a lot more competition uh, among campuses but now we're seeing more a sense of a need for collaboration for all of the demographic and economic reasons that you I uh, discussed earlier. Great, thanks again, guys. Um, here's, you started to answer the next question that I had a little bit, but I'm gonna go ahead with it nonetheless and ask you to talk uh, specifically about the ways that the role that systems can, can play to help address some of the real challenges that we see just around the corner in terms of declining demography, especially of those traditional age students, uh, and also, you know, how that sort of uh, collides with the expectation that that students are paying and 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 uh, bearing the increasingly large costs of of the of the enterprise. So um, you've got throughout your states institutions in very different uh, positions in terms of their health and and viability. And I'm just really curious as to how systems are going to 
wrestle with, with, with some of the profound effects that that might have on them. Well, I could jump in first on that one. And I, you know, I think this is where systems really become more important in terms of leveraging our collective assets in a way that uh, respond to the needs of the state, respond to the needs of the individual students. And we, we wrote about uh, this a bit in our book, Higher Ed Systems 3.0. We talked about the need to evolve systems away from this historic approach of being the regulators and the allocators and the coordinators uh, toward one where they are more about the facilitators and the visionaries and the and the collaborators that we are thinking about ourselves collectively and rather than a uh, a set of individual constituent uh, campuses. So I, you know, being in a system, you have a different perch to be able to, particularly if you have data from our campuses that we can better understand student experiences. And I, just to give an example, one of the things at SUNY we learned was, uh, you know, nearly 50% of all baccalaureate students within, baccalaureate graduates within SUNY actually have attended at least two institutions. Uh, during uh, on their way toward a baccalaureate degree and it's about 30,000 students a year that transfer uh, between our institutions You know, that's something that we need to be thinking differently about because as students come to higher ed now They are no longer thinking about just going to a campus and pursuing a degree They're really swirling through higher ed systems coordinating boards can think about the ways that we can create the policy frameworks about allocating resources about creating enabling policy that allow campuses to better collaborate to support students as they swirl and move between our campuses, whereas at a campus view, you think about when the student comes in and when they leave, but I'm not as worried about what's happening in the, the larger ecosystem. You know, the other piece of it is really thinking more about shared services. Where are the areas that we can increasingly collaborate, whether that be on the academic program side of the house, sharing expertise across campuses, thinking about the ways research can be collaborating with each other, um, but also thinking about just the back end side of this, you know, where uh, there's a lot of redundancy on administrative uh, offices that every campus needs, but perhaps, you know, through economies of scale, we can begin to bring some of that together and, and save monies that could be better invested in student success down the road. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jason hit on a lot of the efficiency items that we would consider that would fall into that uh, bucket also. Uh, Several items that I want to kind of pick up in context to really answer your question. From our from our viewpoint here uh, as a coordinating board, we look at several things. Uh, how much money we can get in our campus coffers to do the job or the needs of the state, especially around student success, gap closing, quality, and so on. And what we've had the last 10 years truly has been money taken out of those coffers. And then now more accountability uh, items put in place such as performance funding or diversity policy that has a uh, really a punitive element to it if you're not successful. But we also know that in order to combat some of those cuts, we've had to increase tuition. And I'm doing a listening tour around Kentucky. One of the items that keep pop, keeps popping up is around affordability and not just uh, real affordability that people are having a hard time to find the money to live and to go to college, but a perception of affordability. In other words, they see the sticker price, may not know all the pieces that go in there that creates a net price, so we have to be more transparent. So as a, as a systems way of thinking, we have to push this transparency in this conversation around affordability and really think about what we're doing around tuition that we have control over. Another item is that we have uh, different demographics in the state and we have institutions serving those demographics, four-year institutions as well as two-year institutions, and many of our rural Appalachian portions of our state in western Kentucky also, we're seeing a de decline in, in traditional student enrollment, I mean a big decline, and this is really having an effect on our institution and since much of our income now Operating incomes coming from tuition, this has an effect on the way we do our business and our argue quality. So how do we address that? Well, there's several things we're trying to think about at a systems level. One is how do we think about getting more out-of-state students here that would stay longer and would pay a little bit of the freight? So we're working on that in some MOAs with our campuses to think about it in that manner. We also have a 53.3% uh, uh, college going rate in many of these areas. How, in fact, can we increase more college going? The way I look at that, we've got 47% to play with. So how do we get more people in there? 
how do we get more adult learners that we have many uh, that that have some college but need more in order to actually have a skilled position that would increase their viability in the workforce. So how do we get more of those adult learners? So I look at that from a systems perspective, and that's what we're pushing. We're also the student success piece, which is a big item. You know, if we actually graduated more people in a timely manner and, uh, and help more students get in the pipeline through our dual credit or more people, especially of color and low income, to stay and to get a degree, then we have a greater chance of accomplishing that. So as we think about uh, the coordinating board and the role we play, we're gonna have to think more disruption. We're gonna have to think differently about how we're doing business because business has changed for us. And so that's the role we get to push, not just from the back office efficiency, and, uh, but the idea about pushing the effectiveness, the quality element, uh, as well as the overall push to serve the state's need in workforce and economic development. So this is the role we're trying to play in that disruption. Thanks, Kino. And I have, I have one more question for, for the two of you before we invite the audience to uh, ask questions of their own. And, and it really kind of goes back to sort of one of the core uh, reasons for systems that came in or, or state agencies came in coming into being and that was the issue of balancing this, the need for statewide strategy with the need for local innovation at the institutional level and I want to uh, invite you to answer that question in what way makes most sense for you but one area that 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 I think it's useful to think about this in terms of where tension exists is around program review uh, which is a common authority of course and and one that it, the organizations that you guys represent uh, have, but actually exercising it sometimes can seem like tripping awfully close to one of the third rails of higher education and can get state agencies and system offices into trouble with the political leadership. So I just wanted to encourage you to, to, to respond to the question about balancing and perhaps by using this program review question as, as a um, foil for understanding how where the tension is and how and how to help address it. I think the uh, it, it, this is a classic area of tension. You're absolutely right, um, particularly in states uh, where we have a lot of authority and responsibility over the coordination of academic uh, programs and planning. And you know, in New York State, one of the added layers I didn't talk about is that beyond SUNY, then it has to go to our state education department for review and approval by them. So there's multiple layers of a review and, and, and probably some redundancy in, in this process that slows down uh, academic innovation in, the, uh, in our academic core. You know, I think at the end of the day, what we need to be thinking about are sort of the ways that we can work within the, uh, the regulation, the constraints that we have to be able to be successful and help our campuses be successful in moving forward. Uh, obviously, being able to facilitate that process is one aspect of it in, a, in, a, in a, the bureaucratic sense, but I think there are other ways that we need to be thinking about uh, ways to incentivize campuses to think differently about the work that they're doing, uh, the, the ways that we could create startup funds. Uh, we've done that in New York around high, high needs areas uh, to help campuses move into uh, new academic programming that is better responding to the economic demands of New York State, particularly regionally. In a state as big as New York, we have 10 regions that are economically very, very diverse. Uh, so a program in New York City is not going to be the same set of programs we might need in, in Buffalo, but it's being in a system perch allows us to think about uh, where those needs are, thinking about the state from a regional perspective, uh, trying to facilitate interinstitutional collaboration because there are such expertise at different sets of institutions. In the same way that we think about on a campus, bringing together interdisciplinarity among departments, uh, there's even, I think, greater uh, abilities to be able to harness uh, the inter-campus connectivity that might exist to be able to uh, create and refine and, and, and deliver new programs in ways that can better serve uh, the needs of the state, and setting, incentivizing institutions to be more flexible in their design and delivery of those programming. So, you know, there's a lot of things that I think that, that we could be doing at a system level uh, that, that facilitates this piece that's separate from that sort of regulatory burden that we bear, but uh, moving beyond that, thinking more about that thought leadership, that visionary piece, that incentivization piece, and how we track and, and, and define data to help students, help campuses be more successful uh, in being transformative and better responding to the market. 
Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, Jason is sitting on a lot of points. Uh, you know, I look at this in basically two ways. One is the way that uh, we need to look at it from what I call that business end or the end that if we have a lot of duplication of services, why is that? Is it more efficient to have uh, less duplication or unnecessary duplication? And that's been the traditional role of program review, I think, which I think has put us really at, a, at somewhat of a weakness or more of that conflict. Uh, and without a doubt, it also in many cases created uh, with, uh, in many cases, our lack of pushing them to be unique. It created a lot of campuses looking like one another. If you get this program, I want that program too. You know, and that has been very much an issue for us in Kentucky. We need our campuses to be more targeted, more specific, more what I call entrepreneurial and more ways of getting people from inside and out of the state to look at them in a couple of three or four specialty areas while at the same time offering the needed uh, uh, areas to back that up. And we have to also be careful in that area that we don't get lost in the, the role and the need of liberal arts because that's tend to be where uh, political folks go and other people go. So that's the one end, you know, whether or not we're doing the kind of uh, look at and, and, and pushing each campus to think of themselves as being unique and not offering duplication of services and of programs. Now, this is where I think we need to be going. I think we need to be thinking more entrepreneurial about how we shape our programs, current programs or new programs, to serve the need of the needs of the state instead of actually building a program purely by faculty and then hopefully an employer will buy into it and then later on tell us it's not what they really wanted that we get employers in on the front end to help design what's needed not just for today's economy but for a future economy they're bringing a lot of knowledge to the table this is where systems can really help do that the other thing too we need to re-engineer some of the duplicate programs we have to make it more what I consider to be high impact uh, for the state and for the nation. So thinking more entrepreneurially and disruptive about how we deliver, as, as Jason said, is also a part of that. How do we reach those audience members that I mentioned earlier that we're leaving out of this ballgame? So how do we also put ourselves in a situation whereby we can target, I'm not talking about gainful, employment here, but how we can target uh, more specifically those that want to come into a particular program and let them know the opportunities for the employment that's out there and what they have to do and the richness of that program. So transparency around what these programs are and what they do is another item that we can push from our uh, bully pulpit stat status. So. I, I would argue that this is a good question, uh, Brian, but it's a good question that needs a new answer, uh, one that is more progressive and disruptive. Now, thanks very much to, to, to both of you. I think with that, I'm going to uh, invite um, Sarah to uh, help us with the audience questions that are coming in. Yes, thank you, Brian. So the first question we received is, Dr. Thompson mentioned that one of the issues needing, needing to be addressed is student success measured by timely graduation and retaining and graduating students of color. How do faculty demographics mirror the population being served in Kentucky? And do you think this is an important ingredient in achieving this goal? Uh, good question. Uh, yes, and but. <laughs> what I believe is uh, that it is very important that we get more people in the pipeline that looks like the student population that we serve in Kentucky. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, we have one institution that's closed the gap around achievement uh, as far as graduation rates go in the state around people of color and, and their white counterparts, but we still don't have enough faculty and staff in mirrors. And, and whoever asked the question surely knows the research around this that says that that increases the likelihood of achievement if we can actually find people that look like those uh, that we're serving. Now, I will tell you this though, but a part of this goes back to the learning paradigm. 
many of us, uh, and I'm of color, many of us had professors and staff that didn't look anything like us that served essential roles in our growth. So my argument is that we need to, in post-secondary, create a learning paradigm instead of a teaching paradigm. And we help all professors to know how to look at students from where students are at and serve them based on the particular needs they're bringing to the table, thus the equity agenda. Uh, the idea that we need to move just beyond, and I want to do better recruitment to get more uh, faculty of color in, in, in the pipeline. Uh, but we also need to understand that my, many of our gaps, for example, are low income. And so how do we serve all of those students that we're leaving behind that historically have been disenfranchised? Well, it's about changing the way that we help faculty to understand how to move from teaching to learning, how to help them to understand that it's about competence, cultural competence, as well as it is about exactly all the resources or lack of resources they're bringing to the table. How do we recognize where a student is at and what they need to have? So I would argue that all of our faculty, no matter what they look like, needs to actually do this because we have a lot of people in the system now that really needs to be skilled up in this area, while at the same time we have to be far more deliberate about how we recruit more faculty and staff of color without a doubt to assist in us achieving what we need to achieve around this equity agenda. Thank you. I'll just jump, oh, I'll just I jump in and add a couple you. of things. I mean, I, uh, 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 Aaron just gave, gave us a great response uh, to the reasons why we need to be doing this. And I'll just add a couple of things SUNY's been thinking about. Uh, we, under uh, our new chancellor, Christina Johnson, uh, launched a new program called Prodigy, uh, which I'm, of course, not going to remember exactly what it stands for, but essentially it's a system wide effort to work with our campuses to uh, really strategically try to recruit uh, those from underserved, uh, traditionally underrepresented uh, backgrounds, as well as women in science, uh, to the SUNY campuses. It's a, it's a struggle that I think we all deal with, particularly trying to figure out how do we uh, make sure that we do have a, a faculty that is representative of our, our vastly changing uh, demographics. Um, that's one aspect of it. The other one is also thinking about that leadership pipeline uh, in and through our campuses. You know, we ran data a couple years ago. Only 12% of our department chairs are from underrepresented uh, groups right now. And so as we think about that pipeline of leaders, uh, even beyond faculty being more systematic in how we are helping uh, those in diverse backgrounds move from faculty roles into leadership roles. And so with the help of Governor Cuomo, uh, two years ago, we launched a Hispanic Leadership Institute, uh, which is something that is a system-wide effort to bring together a network each year, a cohort of, of those from Hispanic backgrounds. Uh, Hispanics are one of the fastest growing populations in New York, uh, to be able to support them in their evolution toward taking a leadership role so that you know, we're thinking both about the faculty piece, but also how, how do we progress and diversify the leadership pipeline as well. And let me add one other thing. Uh, Jason, you're absolutely right. We're doing that in Kentucky. We have a diversity policy that comes from our office that all the campuses have to write a plan around uh, that focuses not just on the enrollment and the numbers of faculty and leaders and policy roles, but it focuses on how do we shape a campus culture not just the climate, but how we shape a campus culture for everybody to be invited. How do we shape a campus culture that goes to learning that closes the gap? Now, we're in the process of actually reviewing all of the results from our first go around here. And bottom line, we, we have worked with them heavily to make sure that they have the right plan and, and know how to be proactive with it. But we also have a stick if we need to use it, we don't want to use it. That is, if they are not progressing both qualitatively and quantitatively, we can deny them any new programs. So it is about being intentional, it's about being deliberate, it's also about understanding that our job, whether it's at the campus level or the state level, is to advance all of our citizens and not just a few based on their demographic profile. So I appreciate your answer, Jason. Thank you both. The next question we have is, you mentioned how state agencies and systems navigate the connections between policymakers and institutions. How can agencies and systems use the data and information they collect from institutions to help them tell their unique stories to policymakers? 
Well, I guess I'll go first. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm a data guy, as some of you know. Uh, we can't do anything without good data and good analytics, data that tells us a story. And the more local we get, the more student level we get, the more micro we get, the better story with more emotional intelligence we get. So we have to do this in a way that campuses don't feel threatened, but feel as if we're value added and taking the resources and the knowledge we have, combining it with theirs, in something that tells a story that gives them a direction that they need to go in order to truly improve. And I think all campuses want this. So a part of this is communicating with them and mentioning policymakers. I tell people my role is to kind of be able to be bi-communicative or multi-communicative. I mean, it's about being able to have the conversations with our policymakers and having them understand what we need to do in order to move the agenda, while at the same time having it with presidents, provosts, and faculty and staff on campuses to help them to move it. Uh, uh, to where they need to and try not to isolate either one of those uh, groups as we do that. Now, what that means is that the more we get things in the hands of the faculty that helps them to understand that all that they do in engaging students uh, as well as staff, then the more outcomes that is beneficial for, the, for their campus as well as for the state. So I, I think it's a collaborative argument that you're posing with this question. And uh, that's the way I would argue that we need to do it. Aaron, I so loved your, your response. That was the first time I've heard anybody link data to emotional intelligence. So I'm totally going to borrow that in the future. Um, you know, I, I absolutely agree. Data is, a, is key to all of the work that we're trying to do, both from evidencing the challenges we're facing as well as the opportunities uh, moving forward. And this is where systems uh, and, and, and courting boards have a perch that's different than the individual campuses to be able to aggregate data and look at themes and trends across multiple campuses uh, and be able to pick up on storylines that I think that can be powerful and meaningful uh, both for campuses but more importantly for our, our outside uh, stakeholders that are, are are looking at us with often skeptical eyes but in ways that we can uh, be able to sort of uh, tell the stories using data to, to bring them along. You know, I think the other piece though also that we've learned is, is, is simply, you know, accountability. And we talk about it all the time, but, um, you know, making data publicly available, holding campuses accountable for certain key metrics, you know, those that are related to their mission. Uh, and, and obviously there's always a contextualization piece here every time we use data that's very important. But, um, you know, I do believe that we've got to be able to track progress, but we also got to be able to look at where our, our weaknesses are and be able to sort of address those as well. Thank you. Our next question is also about the accountability process and metrics. So this question reads, we have a very strong strategic planning and accountability process. The problem is that for certain of the metrics, our governing board sets impossibly high and the governors know it, goals such that 80% of our universities will never get close to that goal. How can you make a silk purse out of that sow's ear? <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously, that's, uh, that, 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 that carried a little weight with it. Uh, I will say this. I, we approach it here in this fashion. Our institutions need to have a win, but it needs to be a win that helps our state. So we, we don't mind uh, in our negotiations, and that's what we have. We come with some very lofty stretch goals because we need them. Uh, however, they are afraid in many cases, especially we have a performance funding system, that they're afraid that if they put too much of it down on the table, that in fact they may get hurt. So we, we have those discussions about moving the state forward and we take our data here and look at our attainment that we need to have for the state. And we basically know what each of our campuses can do based on history. So we use data to help them to know. And then we push them to give us some stretch goals, while at the same time, we will give them some opportunities to be successful. Now, we're going through our mid-year, excuse me, our mid-cycle uh, uh, agenda look now, and we're going to be pushing them because some really achieved their goals uh, really fast, and some achieved it based on the goals weren't lofty enough, and some did it because they just kicked butt. 
So we are going to look best practice here, but we're going to push them to give us some more of what we need to have to move the agenda forward faster. So I, I think it's not an either or here, but it's a both and. I mean, I think you have to be reasonable in understanding where the campuses are coming from, and you have to be able to sell the campuses on the reasonableness of them being a part of the system to achieve what we need to do because there's benefits from that for them if we do. So a part of it is really about how we communicate, especially from my role, and how we communicate, especially from the role as the uh, vice president of our, uh, our, our strategy uh, and policy to help them to understand how all this fits together and how we can be partners in accomplishing both of what we need. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think it's any either, either or. Um, it's, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Jim Collins. We often talk about our BHAGs, right? What are our big, hairy, our audacious goals? And so I think systems have an ability to be able to set, um, you know, big ideas to try to transform higher education, as, as Aaron was talking about, being transformative and um, try to push change. But on the other hand, I think we've got to be realistic about the goals that we're setting for, for campuses and how far they can move within the, the constraints that they have. When we were developing what we called SUNY Excels, which is our performance uh, improvement plan several years ago, it was really a collaborative process, as Aaron talked about, between campuses uh, and the system, first to define what those metrics were going to be, uh, and then what the, the particular uh, indicators were going to be for each campus, and trying to uh, contextualize that. As you can imagine, with 64 campuses, uh, there's a lot of diversity in terms of, of resources uh, and, and the wherewithal to be able to move uh, indicators certain ways. So we really tried to work in a collaborative sense that pushed our campuses all to improve. We were very much about uh, improvement and, and trying to get folks to think about how they could be the best about get, getting better. Uh, that, that, at the end of the day, was our ultimate goal. Uh, but you want to be able to set goals that are, are attainable as well. Well, gentlemen, uh, thank you for answering the, the questions from the audience. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time to, to uh, take up any more questions from the audience, uh, but I want, because I wanted to um, spare a little bit of time for us to just offer some closing takeaway comments. And if it's all right with you all, I'll, I'll, I'll offer uh, what I took away from the conversation so far, and that is that you know, the, the role of systems and of, of systems thinking is something that's still evolving, but there's clearly no less a need for that, the existence and, and the statewide perspective than previously has been the case to balance statewide and institutional interests, to, to really look after thoughtful differentiation among institutions, uh, to exert a much more progressive and proactive form of policy leadership um, across a, a set of diverse institutions and diff facing diverse challenges but all um, essential to uh, the achievement of a set of state goals that are ambitious in many cases and sometimes uncomfortably so uh, for a lot of institutions and even often for the very systems and system leaderships that um, that is setting those goals and charging themselves with, um, with achieving them and being accountable for them. Uh, clearly, it seems to me that there's um, a greater need for collaboration um, for multi-institutional approaches to problems that are uh, around, you know, the, the ways in which students experience institutions now, but but also the way in which it's in, it's it's important to be mindful of the need to make access and uh, to programs available all over the place, but not necessarily in every single place. Um, so there remain considerable tensions around funding mission differentiation, but systems offer various different ways in which they add value around uh, pulling data together, highlighting insights, creating a place for dialogue and for the, the mediation between uh, state policymakers and institutions to occur, and a place to spark um, innovation. So I think um, Dr. Thompson said something akin to this last comment I'll make, which is, that we need new approaches to familiar challenges that are capitalizing on systems thinking. And then I think increasingly we need systems, while still exercising a role around um, some degree of compliance, 
uh, and accountability, there, there also needs to be very much that sort of foresight and um, sp spurring innovation and policy approaches that, that are fit to the times that we are facing in the years ahead. Uh, gentlemen, I, don't, I, I think uh, hopefully you have some uh, other things. You can certainly take issue with what I've said, but um, to close us out. Brian, I don't have issue with anything you just said. I thought it was <laughs> excellent. I, I, I will just say a couple of quick things, and I think it's important. It doesn't matter if you're a coordinating board or a systems board, your role is truly to serve the greater need of the citizens of the state that you operate in or the groups that you represent. Now, part of the groups we represent are the campuses we serve. So how do we offer ourselves up for service to all those that we deal with? That's from the legislators to the governor's office, to our campuses, and to the rest of the citizens that may want to take part in what we're doing or that are taking part. But however, I think we need to set an agenda that makes sense. And it needs not to be an agenda so big that all the campuses are feeling like they're tap dancing to a song that really just has no rhythm. So whatever we do, we need to make sure that we're focused, that we're trying to achieve it. We create a continuous improvement process, whether it's around efficiency, effectiveness, and so on. But we're going to have to start thinking more futuristically, not just what we're preparing students for today, but how we're preparing them to exist 10, 15, 20 years from now. So it really will take a comprehensive way of thinking about it, of pushing it forward from whatever perch we set on, but it's gonna take more transparency and more communication. And it's also gonna take the will, if you will, uh, of all of us to understand that we probably have a lot more resources than we ever thought about, not just monetary resources, but brain power. I mean, we're higher education. We should be able to think this stuff out better. Uh, but we got to do more than think. We have to act. So systemness allows us, and the positions we're both serving in, allows us to not only think that way, but to do that way. Thanks. And in the final moments, Jason? Wow, there's uh, so much there that you guys have commented on that is brilliant that it's hard to follow. Um, you know, I'll just say this, uh, you know, I think systems are one of the great unused linchpins in solving our completion agenda in the United States. If you think about systems, of the 40 some odd systems of higher education alone, not counting the coordinating boards, like in Kentucky, represent, serve more than 75% of all students in public four-year education. And if we can think about ways to leverage these entities that are the collective, like collectivities of multiple institutions, that there's so much power to be able to move the dial on providing high quality learning experiences and ensuring that uh, many more Americans have a high quality uh, credential from higher education. And I think part of it is, as we think about systemness, it's, it's flipping the paradigm a little bit to quit asking why students are failing instead asking how we're failing students and being able to really think about the ways that we can organize our policies, our, our resources, you know, and our institutions in ways that are serving students in the way they're now experiencing higher education as opposed to the way they have been historically. And I think that's where systemness uh, can really add value to, to higher education in the U.S. That's great. Um, Brian, Aaron, and Jason, thank you for sharing those perspectives. And also, uh, thank all of you that listened in on this for participating in this second of our 50th anniversary webinars. On May 10th, we'll be presenting our third webinar in the series. Peter Ewell will host Melanie Booth and George Koo in a discussion that reflects the issues and shifts regarding how we think about quality in higher ed. So please go to the NCHEMS website to register for that. And this webinar will be archived at NCHEMS.org and we encourage you to share that link with others you think might enjoy it. Again, thank you, Brian Prescott, Aaron Thompson, and Jason Lane. And we'll end this here. <laughs>